So we like to keep to our schedule here in the Industrial Revolution Park, Blackstone River Valley National Historical Park. Again, my name is Allison. I'm a park ranger at Blackstone River Valley. I'm joined tonight by my colleague, Mark Mello, who is also a park ranger in the Blackstone. And it is our pleasure to be joined tonight by Richard Condon, who is a park ranger at Reconstruction Era National Historical Park. If you have any very difficult questions or technical questions, you can message Mark Mello in the chat. And to get all of us started, we would love if you could tell us where you are joining us from tonight, just to give us a sense of who is tuning in. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and just give us a little bit of an introduction. We'll also just have Rich say hello uh, to greet everybody from the chat. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Rich. I'm coming to you from beautiful, sunny Beaufort, South Carolina, right smack dab between Savannah, Georgia and Charleston, South Carolina. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you, Mark and Allison, for having me tonight. Yeah, it's really our pleasure. I'm going to go ahead and share our presentation here. So we started this series parked at home last year, partially because we knew that a lot of people were still not able to get out to their national parks because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And also because we knew that there are so many themes that unite our national parks all across the country. If you have had the pleasure of visiting Blackstone River Valley National Historical Park, you may be surprised to learn tonight that we actually have quite a bit in common with the way that Reconstruction Era National Historical Park is set up. We are made of six separate historic sites that are connected by a few big themes, including labor, land, and opportunity. And across those six sites, we tell the story of the evolution of industry. My background and Mark Mello's background include Old Slater Mill, which is one of the parts of the park where we tell that story of the start of industry in 1793. Big part of that story is the global reach of industry and the global connections that made industry possible. So far, we have talked to rangers in different parts of the country and Dr. Megan Kate Nelson. We still are going to be connecting with people in Skagway, Alaska and New Orleans down in Louisiana. If you've missed any of our previous programs, they are all on YouTube, and this is also being recorded if you're just joining us tonight. Our site, as I mentioned, is made up of six separate historic places, and they're stretched out over a 40 plus mile area. At all of those places, we tell stories that actually have a lot to do with reconstruction in multiple ways. When we take kind of a more literal approach to reconstruction, we might think about rebuilding or repair. A lot of why Mark and I have a job as park rangers interpreting all of these sites is because people have taken great care to repair and restore historic mill buildings. People have taken the time and effort to make them available to us. And so that is one way of thinking about reconstruction. But Reconstruction is also a period of time in United States history. So we can think of that as Reconstruction with a capital R. And that's a hugely important piece of what we talk about as well. Maybe you haven't heard that word on one of our programs or you haven't thought about it specifically, but that period of time is very important to United States history. Reconstruction Era National Historical Park focuses on the years 1861 to 1900, so from the start of the Civil War to the turn of the century, and Rich is going to tell us all about the upheavals, transformations, and important moments in that period. It's a hugely important era, and yet people don't know very much about it. If you attended our talk two weeks ago, we were joined by a ranger at Ellis Island, and we talked about the advent of that particular immigration station and the boom in immigration and industrialization that occurred in the late 1800s. That period that we discussed two weeks ago and tonight's topic actually overlap. So if we were to think of United States history as one big long book, these are chapters that should be spliced together not just thought of as two separate topics. 
when you think about the late or mid 1800s, a lot of different images might come to mind. My background shows Slater Mill right around the same time as this image that I have on screen, which shows a cotton mill on Port Royal Island. These two types of images are connected in ways that we'll discuss over the next hour or so. But when you think of the mid to late 1800s, you might have other images that populate your mind when you think about the United States. You may think of people moving west. You might think of people who are in pioneer garb. You might think of folks who are populating other parts of the country. Or you might think of people immigrating into the United States. In the Blackstone Valley specifically, this is what it looked like right around the time of the true Reconstruction era period. We'll be talking tonight about how people dealt with the Civil War, how they lived through it, what Reconstruction with a capital R refers to, but know that as Rich is talking about his park, this is what part of the Blackstone Valley looked like. So we have this image of Slater Mill behind me, and we have this evolution up to the Mill Village. Over a pretty short period of time, mills like Slater's went from being kind of unusual and experimental to being a way of life in one part of the country. And the cotton economy in places like Port Royal and other parts of the United States, they are what sustained these mills and mill villages. And then other things started to change. We want to think tonight as we get into our discussion of reconstruction of technology playing a role, but not determining exactly how things change. As mills and factories start to look different, they start to be made out of brick instead of wood, as they start to have signs that they are being run by steam instead of water power. We have these bigger social changes that are happening in the background as well. The Civil War was a huge upheaval for everyone who lived through it, but Reconstruction did not just happen down in the South. Reconstruction was a national process of figuring out how people were going to live in the wake of the Civil War. And this is what part of the Blackstone Valley looks like in those immediate years. They're booming. We have people building more housing. We have people entering the country. And we also have this slow transformation that they didn't know would be the undoing of industry in the Northeast. Because if you don't need water power and you don't need the specific assets that you have in the Northeast, you can build a mill anywhere. And that's going to prove to be very important as well. So I wanna make sure that we learn all about what reconstruction means in a different part of the country. And we'll come back to some of these topics in just a little bit, but I'm gonna stop screen sharing and we're gonna hear from Rich about what his park looks like. I mentioned that our park, Blackstone River Valley, is made up of these different historic sites where we try to connect these different threads about industry, about how small mills, where they're spinning cotton into thread, grow into mill villages, grow into these big booming places. And we're going to learn how a different historic park made just a few years around the same time as ours connects a different set of stories which is how do people who are presented with an opportunity to work land that, to, sorry, to own land that they have worked on, how do people seize this opportunity? And what might that have to do with the industrial Northeast? So we'll come back to that, but I'm gonna stop screen sharing so that we can hear from Rich and get a kind of visual tour of the low country and head down to South Carolina. We'll just mention that we typically talk in the Northeast when we talk about mills like Slater's, or we show you places like Ashton Village, we're showing you parts of the industrial Northeast where people are working with cotton. We call that the cotton economy. It's very easy for us to get very abstract when we talk about that, but we're always talking about real people, real people who are employed in mills, real people who are working with a product, and people in other parts of the nation who are either forced to grow that product, to fashion it into something that can go up to the mills, or people who are perhaps finally given an opportunity near the end of the Civil War to own their own land to grow that product and to learn what they do with that opportunity. So Rich, I would love if you could give us that tour and kind of take us out of the Blackstone Valley and into the Low Country. <laughs> 
Absolutely. And, uh, and thank you for such a, a great uh, tour of your facilities and uh, your story. Um, and, you know, I, I like that you kind of introduced uh, this idea of reconstruction as not necessarily a uh, physical rebuilding of, of facilities. Uh, I will say right off the bat, you know, when I, when I ask uh, visitors to our, our park here in South Carolina, um, what, what they believe reconstruction was, it's usually um, this vision of uh, Southern cities and towns being literally rebuilt in the wake of the American Civil War and in the wake of years of destruction. Um, but it's a lot more than that. Uh, it's the literal, uh, literal and figurative rebuilding of our country in the wake of the Civil War, but as a free society, a place that is uh, better than it was in, say, 1861. Um, and so, and of course, you know, that plays a large part in what's happening here in the American South, but it's happening uh, across the country. Um, so I'm going to real quick, do a screen share. And we'll kind of, as, as Allison mentioned, give you a, a brief tour of uh, our park here in Beaufort County, South Carolina. So uh, you may ask, why, uh, why does this park exist here on the South Carolina Sea Islands uh, as opposed to anywhere else in the country? Um, you know, this, this park has been here since uh, January of 2017. Uh, it was actually designated a national monument by President Obama as as he was exiting office. Um, and then two years later in 2019 was redesignated a national historical park. Um, and when people think of a national park, they they usually think of uh, you know a big swath of land preserved by the federal government. We're not uh, we're not that. Um, we're about 67 acres uh, of property spread amongst two islands between. Uh, Port Royal Island, where I am right now, I'm actually in the town of Beaufort, uh, and St. Helena Island. And uh, of course, our, our park um, thrives on partnerships with community partners as well. Um, but, you know, this, this story of reconstruction, as I mentioned, takes place across the country. But here, the reason it exists here is because it began here the earliest and lasted the longest out of any place in the entire country. We actually begin reconstruction here in 1861. In fact, just about seven months after uh, the first shots, the Civil War fired at Fort Sumter, which is about 60 miles from where I'm sitting. Um, and we go to about 1900. So we're, we're covering about half a century of history here. Um, and the reason we extend reconstruction so long, you know, you usually see it ending in most places around 1877, uh, is these sea islands, uh, between Charleston and Savannah are about 90% African American. And, um, you know, there's no bridges that are actually spanning the gap between these islands and the mainland until the 20th century. So, you know, most of the 19th century and beforehand, uh, this is kind of uh, an area that's in its own, own little bubble. Um, this becomes the perfect incubator for reconstruction uh, during the Civil War. So, um, I saw a lot of people in the chat uh, are from the Northeast region. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a break from, I imagine you have some cold weather up there. Uh, I'm not gonna rub it in too much, but it's about 75 to 80 degrees here right now. Um, but there's a lot of pollen flying around. So I guess there's a little, a little caveat there. But um, just to kind of, uh, and we'll get to the facilities we have here in a second. Uh, but something I want to talk about first is, is how does Reconstruction even begin here uh, in the heart of South Carolina, in the heart of a place where um, the secession movement took, uh, took root in the 1850s prior to the Civil War? Um, and so, you know, what, what we talk about here when we talk about Reconstruction during the Civil War is something called the Port Royal Experiment. Um, this is something that begins... In late 1861, uh, as I mentioned, seven months after the first shots of the Civil War are fired. Uh, in fact, federal troops uh, will basically paint a big old target here on the low country, right between Charleston and Savannah, uh, for a multitude of reasons. Number one, um, you know, as I mentioned, this is where it all began. The idea of secession is birthed here. Uh, the first shots of the Civil War are fired not too far away here, from here. 
And so imagine the moral blow to the Confederacy in 1861 if, if federal troops arrived right here in the heart of where it all began. Number two, uh, Port Royal Sound, um, or, or also known as the Broad River, um, is the deepest natural harbor south of New York City here on the eastern seaboard. So if they could establish a fueling station here, they could blockade the ports of uh, Charleston and Savannah, for example. Thirdly, if they can put boots on the ground here, they could launch land attacks against those two uh, Confederate strongholds. But also, there is that, that cotton industry. You know, if the federal government can capitalize on this cotton industry that had really um, built the you know, economy and, and really all, most of society in this area is built on slave labor and uh, the sale of sea iron cotton, uh, if they could monetize that, they could pump that money back into uh, the war effort. And ultimately, what's what is happening right here? Um, so on November seventh, eighteen sixty one, kind of long story short, a uh, a massive naval fleet, seventy seven U.S. ships, arrives here in Port Royal Sound, carrying almost thirteen thousand U.S. soldiers. Uh, by this point, uh, a lot of the the white inhabitants of the islands, a lot of the plantation owners, had left the area uh, once they heard federal troops were were entering the region, and uh, Left behind were approximately 10,000 enslaved African Americans on these islands. And in fact, you can see some examples on uh, the left hand side here. You can see some people that were enslaved on the John Joyner Smith plantation, which is about uh, three, four miles south of uh, Beaufort on the same island. Um, same thing on the, the bottom right hand corner is a fairly well known photo called Five Generations on the Smith plantation. And so these are among the people who uh, aren't necessarily free quite yet uh, on November 7th, 1861, but they're taking steps away from enslavement. Um, these are the people who are harvesting the Sea Island cotton, the ones that, uh, that harvested the food that uh, built the dwellings in this area. They, they literally built everything we see around us here uh, in Beaufort, South Carolina. When U.S. troops uh, land on the islands in November of 1861, these are the people that are greeting them on the shores of Beaufort County. Um, and so shortly after, the U.S. military and the federal government has to figure out, all right, how do we rebuild an infrastructure here in a place where it's all fallen apart? How do we extend things like health care and education to newly freed people uh, who were uh, largely denied these things by law previously? Um, and this kind of sparks what the, the government's going to call the Port Royal Experiment. Um, you know, when we think experiment or the word experiment, we think uh, trial and error, for example. And so the government asks questions like, you know, if we put pencils in the hands of freed people, are they going to want to learn how to read and to write? Well, yes, they were denied that by law previously. Um, if we... Uh, if we put weapons in the hands of newly freed men, are they going to fight for their freedom and the freedom of others? Well, absolutely. That's some, that was the, the worst fear of white planters in the pre-war years. Um, if we pay them for their labor, will they want to work? Well, yes, they've never been paid for a work a day in their life. Um, and of course, kind of the subject of what we're talking about tonight is this idea of land ownership. Um, you know, will they want to to own an, their own piece of land where they can plant their own crops, raise their families and live as freed people? Of course, um, they're denied that as well. And so starting in 1862, uh, the U.S. government starts to work with Freedmen's Aid Societies in places like Boston and New York City and Philadelphia. And so by the spring of 62, there are teachers and doctors um, and uh coming down here by the dozens, the missionaries come here by the dozens, and this place is just turned on its head. So basically now, by 1862, you have the uh, seeds of reconstruction being planted on top of the, the old dead crop of secession, where it all began. And, um, you know, of course, um, African Americans are now being paid for their labor to, to harvest the cotton on these plantations that were abandoned. Um, they're being paid 40 cents a day. And throughout 1862 into early 1863, there are tax commissioners here in this, this military department, the Department of the South, 
uh, who are appraising all this land that's been abandoned by the, the white plantation owners, the previous owners. And of course, the, the government takes whatever they need for their purposes, whether it be hospitals or for the quartermaster, or commissary department, anything you need for a functioning army. Um, but what's left over, they're going to begin distributing to freed people of the islands. Uh, in fact, they do, they do give a, a, a fair chance to the, the former plantation owners. Um, they'll actually publish in newspapers in 1862 a notice saying that they have 60 days to pay delinquent taxes on their property as they are uh, declared to live in uh, an insurrectionary district. If you, uh, well, part of the deal is you have to come here and pay those taxes in person. But also, you're going to have to uh, declare your allegiance to the United States of America. Out of approximately 209 plantation owners, 12 of them come back and do that. So the rest of that property is fair game because it hasn't been claimed by them. So you know, you're paying these freed people for the better part of a year. And in early 1863, uh, these tax commissioners will start to auction off property. You know, Of course, there's these big, beautiful homes around Beaufort that are praised by the government. And then acres upon acres of land are going to be sold off at $1.25 per acre. So starting in 1863, these people you see pictured here on the Smith Plantation are finally becoming property owners and landowners and living that true American dream of actually having their own property where they can do uh, what they please. Uh, and so this is kind of a big theme we discuss here uh, in, in this part of South Carolina is this idea of land ownership. Because a lot of these people that eventually get this land, they're, they're going to retain that property uh, in, in many cases for generations. Um, but kind of moving forward here, um, you know, the, the, the facilities through which we discuss this story of land ownership and, and labor reform, uh, as I mentioned before, are spread out uh, amongst a few places. In fact, right here, uh, what you're looking at is our main visitor center in downtown Beaufort. This is the building which I'm currently in, um, and uh, this sits right in the heart of the town of Beaufort. It's actually a post-reconstruction uh, era building. This is built about 1911, but if you're standing here, uh, say in 1863, looking in this direction, you're actually standing in an open-air market. Uh, so here is where, you know, during the Civil War, for example, freed people uh, are making a living uh, selling various supplies, whether it be food, clothing, et cetera. Um, and so we have our, our main visitor center here with an exhibit that actually talks about reconstruction uh, in the, the larger or national sense. Um, at another location, which I'll show you, we kind of talk about it more so on, on the local level. Uh, in fact, another uh, theme that we discuss here is this idea of education. Um, you know, when federal troops establish that foothold here, uh, when those teachers start to come down here in 1862, they start to establish schools all over the Sea Islands. Uh, and this is one of the earliest, uh, actually known as Penn School, uh, which was established in June of 1862 uh, by two women from Philadelphia, uh, Laura Town and Ellen Murray. And so this photograph uh, was actually taken out on St. Helena Island at our other location, uh, showing the entire student body, which is about 200 scholars. And uh, there's two teachers in this photograph. Uh, one you can actually see on the front porch of the school building of Penn School, and the other one uh, off in a crowd uh, off to the, the right-hand side. So, of course, uh, another major theme we discuss here is education of freed people. Uh, we do that through this facility, which is called Dara Hall. Uh, this is the oldest standing building on Penn Center's campus today. Uh, this building was constructed about 1900 uh, and for a long time operated as a community center for the African-American community on St. Helena Island. So everything from uh, weddings, funerals, temperance meetings, union meetings, all held in this building. In fact, on the uh, original floorboards inside, you can still see lines from the basketball court uh, that was used uh, up until not too long ago. So thankfully, uh, this is a facility through which we can tell that local story of reconstruction, whether it be land ownership or education um, land ownership being a big one still here because, you know, a lot of the uh, African-American uh, landowners and farmers on St. Helena Island 
can trace the roots of that ownership to the Reconstruction era. It's, it's a legacy of Reconstruction. And across the street is a Brick Baptist Church. Uh, this is actually where uh, Penn School conducted most of their classes during the Civil War uh, between 1862 and late 1864. Um, the church was actually built by enslaved people in 1855 for the white planter class on St. Helena Island, and those are the, uh, the graves you see here in the, the cemetery. But about seven years after they built this church, uh, they're setting foot in here as scholars or students uh, for the first time. And, uh, of course, it becomes a functioning church for the African-American community on the island. And to take that a step further, in the, uh, the years after the Civil War, actually starting in 1868, this is where African-American men of the island cast their vote for the first time. So this becomes the, the voting precinct uh, for St. Helena Island. Um, and of course, uh, our third site, uh, which I, I believe I might have mentioned, is Camp Saxton. Uh, it sits about four miles south uh, of Beaufort. Um, this uh, was a former plantation. This is actually the John Joyner Smith plantation. So those photos that I showed you earlier of, of some of the enslaved people on Port Royal Island, this is where they would have been enslaved, on this cotton plantation uh, that was once 700 acres. Um, but during the war, was taken over by the federal government. And uh, they actually established a military base here on these grounds that they would call Camp Saxton. It was about 160 acres along the Beaufort River and uh, became the first training ground and recruiting facility for African-American soldiers here. In fact, on January 1st, 1863, at this location, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation is read for the first time publicly to a group of about 5,000 people, most of them being uh, former slaves. Um, and it, it's very likely this is maybe the first place anywhere in the country where this document is read publicly. Um, so through these, these three different sites, and of course, um, you know, we talk about not just the local story, but the national story. This gives us a jumping off point to, the, to have that larger discussion about reconstruction. Um, and that's all I have for as far as the, the slideshow goes. So let me stop sharing here. Um, but of course, like I said, uh, we don't just talk about reconstruction on the local level. Um, we, we talk about it uh, through this lens from all over. So. Thank you so much. Now that we're all jealous of your warmer temperatures, or I think mostly. So I don't think the photos reflected that very well. It was very bleak looking and foggy. I think <laughs> I went went with a darker tone on that one. Yeah, and, and I want to make sure that people, we asked where folks were tuning in from. We always like to know, are people local? Which, which park kind of, you know, did you hear about this from? If you'd like to share in the chat questions that you have about this, and so we can, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about like some of that connection based on what you just discussed and then we'll let some questions pile up in the chat. I see we already have a great one, but something you mentioned quite a bit about and part of why I wanted to show those photographs of the Ashton Village, which are a core part of our national park. I wanted to kind of give us some common ground and some kind of interesting topic Reconstruction, I think, tends to be taught to people as a process that happens in the South, because there is a huge physical impact of the Civil War on parts of the American South. There's this literal rebuilding that needs to happen. A lot of mills shut down during the Civil War, or a lot of mill owners chose during this period of disruption in the economy to upgrade, to change, to economize, to do something different. And I wanted to show us that Ashton village circa 1870, not just because we would see a large mill complex, very much a product of that early post-war era, but also to point out that all the folks who would have lived in those small brick houses that we see in a mill village like Ashton, they are not landowners. And so part of what's happening in the middle decades of the 1800s in Rhode Island has a land owning provision for suffrage for voting is people who are electing to live in most of these mill villages, not only do they not own land, they may never own land. And so they effectively become disenfranchised, even if they are white and male by living in these villages. 
I wonder, Rich, if you could just talk about this period that you really focus in on in the early 1860s, maybe a few personal stories. What kind of impact land ownership had almost right away on people? This opportunity to own land as something totally novel for people who had been held in bondage and now have this chance to become landowners, sometimes of property they'd actually worked on for most of their lives. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, if we think of this idea of land ownership, I, I, I think it really goes hand in hand with this idea of true freedom. Um, the freedom to do what you want with your land, on your land. Um, and I think that's something that we still see today in this country. Um, but, you know, of course, a lot of these uh, enslaved people on the Sea Islands, they had worked this land all their lives. And now they have the opportunity to, in, in many cases, buy the property that once belonged to their enslavers. You know, what's, uh, I can't think of a, a better form of poetic justice, actually. Um, but, you know, a lot of these people um, buy this land and, and in many cases kind of chunk their money together uh, to buy property, uh, you know, large swaths of property on these sea islands. Um, and of course, this is a place where they can finally build a home that they can call their own, a permanent place. Um, you know, but obviously now they have the freedom to kind of travel where they want to in, in this area that's federally occupied. Um, they can finally plant their own crop. They can live off themselves. They can plant their own cotton if they wish to, uh, to sell that as well. And, and you see that during post-war uh, reconstruction too. I think, um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of a couple of uh, individual stories here. Um, you know, people like um, Robert Smalls, a lot of people might have heard of. Uh, I think his name is becoming much more familiar to a lot of Americans. Um, you know, as as we start to become more familiar with with the Reconstruction era, you know, he buys uh, his enslaver's house um, at 511 Prince Street for six hundred and five dollars in late 1863, early 1864. But of course, he also starts to buy up land as well. So some some people might not just buy, you know, a couple of acres of land, they might buy land uh, on two different islands, they might own a house and land on a different island. So it, it kind of varies. Um, downtown Buford, a lot of these large homes, um, you know, of course, are purchased by a lot of uh, white northern officers during the war, because they, they find cheap uh, waterfront property, but about 80 to 90 percent of the property by 1864 is going to be owned by African Americans who were once enslaved here. So, so things change pretty rapidly, um, and it stays that way uh, until the early uh, mid 1870s. Um, you know, you have, uh, in fact, in 1873, a large economic collapse, um, and here in Buford, actually, one of the first uh, Freedmen's Banks is established uh, in 1864. In 65, of course, when the uh, the National Freedmen's Bank was was established, it was sanctioned by the federal government, um, but not operated by the federal government. Uh, it was essentially a corporation. And so uh, when this economic collapse happens, uh, the Freedmen's Bank goes under, just as many other banks did. And these people who've been working for the better part of a decade uh, lose almost all their, all their savings. Uh, tragically. Well, you know, a lot of white landowners in the region can still go to another bank and get a loan. However, will that loan be extended to freed people as well? And so now you, you know, have people who can't afford perhaps to feed and seed on their farms or property taxes. And that's when you see uh, in some parts of, this, uh, of the state here, uh, people actually start to lose some of that land they got during the Civil War. Uh, others, you know, get that land later on when they, when they, uh, accumulate wealth again. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there's still people on the Sea Islands who just maintain that property since Reconstruction. So it's it's pretty remarkable because when you look outside of the Sea Islands here, like if you go along the Georgia coast or even up toward uh, Charleston, a lot of people who got property during Reconstruction, um, especially ones that were tied to, for example, uh, William Tecumseh Sherman's orders number 15. If you ever heard the term 40 acres and a mule, uh, 40 acres, uh, a lot of that land is stripped from freed people 
uh, as we get into the latter part of 1865. So that, that really makes this place pretty special as they had uh, kind of, in many cases, had purchased it outright with the wages they made uh, during early reconstruction in the Civil War. Yeah, and we, we had a question which I think ties this kind of north-south story together really well, which is the question of the carpetbagger. And you can talk a bit about, you know, what, what that word might, might mean in different contexts, but this question about people from the north are active to some degree, you could say in intervening, in furthering reconstruction. And we have a story that's specifically from one of our park sites, which is Hopedale, Massachusetts, that I think might shed some light. And then you can, you know, talk a bit about it from the other side. If you were heavily engaged in abolitionist circles, or if you were very interested in the question of black freedom in the mid 19th century in the Northeast, you would have been reading about things like Port Royal with a lot of excitement. And we know that some people in factory towns, we know that some people in mill villages were very keen to see this happen. Hopedale, which had been founded by radical abolitionists in 1842, that's one of our park sites in Massachusetts, the folks who had created a commune there were against slavery and they were also pacifists. And so when the Port Royal experiment becomes known to them, they want to send some of their missionaries down to the site. People in Hopedale tend to be highly educated. They're very interested in the question of Christian readership. They think literacy is very important, but they are fiercely anti-war. And they are having fights with people like Frederick Douglass about the question of Black leadership in the military. They are against anyone serving in the military. And we have documentation that some of these missionaries are actually rejected from Port Royal. People don't want them coming down because they believe that their strong anti-war stance and their stance against any men serving in the war would be alienating to Black men for whom that military service is so important. They end up fundraising and they send money and there is a sewing circle in Hopedale where people make things for people in Port Royal. Hopedale is obviously a bit of an extreme. If you attend any of our other talks when we tend to talk about Hopedale, it was a place where people had pretty radical beliefs for the time period. But if you could just talk a bit about what was going on with these missionaries? Why were people from the North coming down? What were some of their motivations was our question that we got. And there's probably a mix, right? There's probably different reasons why people are interested in being part of this experiment. Absolutely. And, and kind of going back uh, first to that uh, question about the carpet bagger. Um, when I ask people, you know, if they've learned about reconstruction and say high school or college, those the two terms they remember, if anything, is uh, carpet bagger and scallywag. And so, you know, carpet bagger is, yeah, it's, it's somebody uh, typically from the Northeast region who uh, heads south during Reconstruction, whether it be during or after uh, the Civil War, and, uh, you know, are people who are looking to um, kind of capitalize on what's happening here in the South, who uh, are looking to help freed people in most, most situations um, or searching for new business ventures. For example, uh, Laura Town and Alan Murray from Philadelphia, who established Penn School on St. Helena Island, would be referred to uh, by uh, many secessionists in the area as carpetbaggers, when what they're really doing is coming here uh, with, you know, uh, the genuine in, uh, interest of newly freed people at heart. Uh, but, you know, people are people. I mean, some people come here with those genuine interests at heart, and some don't. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, a lot of the people that come down here during the early stages of Reconstruction, during the Port Royal Experiment, uh, are a lot of abolitionists that wanted to put what they've been preaching for years into practice. This is the first time they have this opportunity to actually kind of have a hand in Reconstruction uh, and, and kind of creating, you know, what is this country going to look like when all this is over? Um, and so I think. Um, you know, of course, things could have gone much differently, too. Uh, if you look at the leadership, for example, um, when the Department of the South, the Military Department of the South is established here uh, in 1862, placed at the head of the department is a guy named David Hunter. Now, he's a, a staunch abolitionist from New York State. Um, he's a West Point graduate. 
Um, and he's great at commanding from, from kind of the, the 30,000 foot view. Well, he's, you know, this abolitionist who comes here with these ideas such as arming African-American men, having them fight for their freedom and the freedom of others, and also uh, asserting their status as citizens in this country. If you would have, I think, had anyone that wasn't someone like David Hunter, say George McClellan at the, the head of this department, uh, things might have gone a lot differently. David Hunter is uh, inviting abolitionists to come here in droves and take part in this Port Royal experiment and, um, and foster a healthy atmosphere for Reconstruction to be a massive success, and it was. You know, it's a huge success here. This, like I said earlier, what happens here during the war, um, not just because of the abolitionists that, that are here, but also the African-American community, of course, self-emancipating African-Americans, even from the mainland. They make this the blueprint for how Reconstruction should turn out across the country. And what you're talking about, I think it's helpful when we look at the Northeast and the Blackstone Valley specifically, we have these kind of two poles that constitute the Blackstone Valley, the city of Providence, Rhode Island in the south, and the city of Worcester, Massachusetts in the north. And the Blackstone River starts in Worcester, and it flows right down to the woodcut. So what's behind me? That's, that's where the Blackstone River stops and turns into something else. And across that area, if you had told people in the 1840s that within the next generation, there was basically going to be this entire upheaval of life. Right? Part of the story that we tell in the Blackstone Valley is the development of mills, followed by mill villages, factory towns, and an industrialized way of life. People no longer making so many things at home, but relying on mass production through industrial development. And in the 1840s in Rhode Island, there is actually a huge rebellion that takes place it's called the Doors Rebellion. And part of what's happening is people who have been cut out of voting in Rhode Island people who are not able to vote because they don't own land, basically just about everybody in the state, it turns into an armed rebellion and someone claiming that he is the head of the state only to be deposed afterward. And a central conflict that comes out of that is does this really mean universal suffrage? And to kind of win a smaller war, white leaders in the Door Rebellion decide that they are not going to ultimately advocate for black suffrage that they are not going to put Black people's rights ahead of their own or alongside their own. Thinking about what you're talking about with these 1860s experiments at Port Royal, I think it would have felt for a lot of people like the world turned upside down. Thinking about our mill villages where people are not enslaved, where people have elected to work, even there, the notion of taking over the owner's house taking over the home of the factory owner, of the mill village owner's house, right? These big houses that tend to punctuate all the smaller ones in the mill village. There's a question in the chat, you know, is reconstruction just happening in the civil war or is it a longer process? We would be here until next year if you tried to answer the question of, of reconstruction, how long it takes. Capital R reconstruction is defined by your park as about a 40 year period. I think there's something to be said about zooming in a little bit on those years during the war with this highly experimental phase and then getting us to the 1870s. What happens next? Does this keep going? Is this forestalled? I know some of the answer, but kind of zooming in on, on your park story, um, this amazing moment of land ownership, this transfer of power, what happens within the first 10 to 15 years? So you know, kind of backing up during the war, Reconstruction, of course, as I mentioned, it begins here, the earliest, lasts here, the longest. But with this kind of being that blueprint, this is what they can apply as federal troops start to fan out across the American South, as they start to uh, kind of suppress the rebellion in certain parts of the country. For example, New Orleans uh, and that part of Louisiana. Uh, as early as April 1862, a lot of the same things that are happening here are also happening there. Things like, uh, you know, African Americans enlisting in the military, um, or uh, you know, um, uh, in parts of uh, Mississippi, um, African American soldiers are being armed. This idea of of land ownership too, and of course the Georgia coast and, and a little bit north of here. Um, 
So it's kind of dictated by the presence of federal troops and enforcing federal law. Um, and once the war is over in 1865, of course, um, you know, I know a lot of us, including myself, were taught in high school that the once the war ended, all the enslaved people in this country went free and everyone lived happily ever after. That's, you know, very far from the truth. It's just the beginning. Um, you know, even with the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, that's, you know, uh, this wartime measure that's passed in 1863, um, the abolishment of slavery is not solidified in the U.S. Constitution until the ratification of the 13th Amendment in December of 1865. So months after the war is over, uh, slavery is forever abolished in uh, the United States with the exception of punishment for a crime. That's a whole other story in itself. Uh, and of course, you know, you have two other amendments that are passed in the wake of the Civil War. In 1868, the uh, 14th Amendment is ratified, which uh, guarantees birthright citizenship in this country and uh, quality under the law. And then, of course, in 1870, the, the final of the Reconstruction Amendments is the 15th Amendment, uh, which essentially bars states from uh, preventing people to, to vote based on the race or the color of their skin. Of course, uh, at this point, it just applies to African-American men. We still have some time. We have quite a while before this applies to uh, women as well. But even with these amendments passed, the 13th, the 14th, uh, the 15th, there still has to be a force that, that enforces this. There has to be uh, an arm of the government that is actually you know, preventing people from circumventing these, these amendments. And it's not something that's static. The, these amendments apply today just as they did in the 1860s and 1870s. Um, they're, they're alive, uh, they're, 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 they're functioning today just as they did back then. Um, but, you know, of course, uh, Reconstruction in most places goes on, as I mentioned earlier in the program, until uh, 1877. At this point, um, you know, U.S. troops are, there's a certain number of troops still in the South that are enforcing these amendments. However, in 1877, uh, there's a, um, uh, during the, the presidential election between Tilden and, and Hayes, Rutherford B. Hayes, uh, they have something called the Great Compromise of 1877 where essentially uh, white Southern Democrats agree to elect Hayes into office as long as he promises, uh, among other things, to pull federal troops out of the South. And this is a large part of why uh, Reconstruction begins to uh, you know, be, be dismantled in the American South. You don't have troops there anymore to enforce these, uh, these laws, these federal laws. And so, um, you know, a lot of people look at Reconstruction uh, based on the way it's described at the end of the 19th century uh, and the beginning of the 20th century. If you look at a lot of books, uh, especially from that time period, it, it paints Reconstruction as this massive failure, when in fact it's defeated, it's dismantled. You have groups like the Ku Klux Klan and the Red Shirts and the White League um, that are intimidating Black voters uh, in the American South. and uh, you know, also, this allows them to kind of insert politicians to dismantle it from the inside as well. And of course, in the 1870s, there's a lot of uh, Northerners who just uh, lost interest in, in Reconstruction in the South. You know, once they passed these three Reconstruction Amendments, a lot of people felt that they had done their, their duty. But it needed to be taken much further. If Reconstruction had continued unimpeded, um, I think it would have been known in many communities as a massive success. Yeah, you're bringing up a really important point. And I was thinking about what's happening in the industrial Northeast and what's happening in other parts of the country along this same timeline. I think it's almost impossible to underestimate how traumatic these years were, but also how exciting, right? These two things braided together. This notion that people who had fought sometimes their whole lifetime to be liberated are now self-liberated and able to actually own land and to exercise citizenship, some of them for the first time for this, this small period. And I think it also calls to mind how much is changing in the United States. There's a question about what happens to those 40 acres, what happens to those promises. I think it's worth bearing in mind that when these promises are being considered in the early years of reconstruction, 
the federal government is exercising tremendous power elsewhere to advance industry. We have mining acts where huge tracts of land are given to companies. We have the creation of the land grant college system where huge tracts of indigenous land are taken and given or sold to finance public education throughout the United States. Exactly, someone is mentioning University of Rhode Island, most land grant colleges are either a direct result of land from indigenous people or the sale of indigenous land to finance. There's this huge amount of real estate that is circulating, that is being sold, that is benefiting industry. So what happens to this 40 acre promise? Why does that particular promise fall so short, but seem to work so well in this one part of the country where you're located? So one thing to note is that uh, not everyone's on the same page when it comes to reconstruction during reconstruction. So for example, uh, President Andrew Johnson, who succeeds Abraham Lincoln after his assassination, uh, his policy is largely based on this idea of reconciliation over reform. And, uh, and so part of that reconciliation is returning uh, lands to its previous owners. So you know, for example, a lot of the land that is declared uh, to be part of that 40 acre promise, for example, uh, in 1865, uh, it says that the the African Americans who live on that land are basically working it off uh, as they occupy the property and eventually will pay it off. Well, in late 1860, later part of 1865, that that promise is being broken as Andrew Johnson says that okay, we're going to start returning this to. Uh, the former, uh, the former landowners, and basically these people just had to uh, apologize to him, <laughs> apologize to the federal government for uh, for an insurrection. And so, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, in places up and down the coast, uh, and about thirty miles inland, a lot of that property is being returned to, say, former Confederates. Um, However, in this area, like I said before, this kind of remains a place where African Americans maintain ownership of the property because they had paid for it through the federal government during the Civil War, during the uh, early stages of Reconstruction. Um, and that's, you know, the same idea can be applied to the Freedmen's Bureau that's established in early 1865. Um, you know, Johnson was not a supporter of the Freedmen's Bureau. In fact, uh, when the bill was signed, it created its uh, its lifespan is supposed to be one year. How do you connect four million formerly enslaved people with their families? How do you, you know, help get them on their feet, get them medical care, get them clothing? How do you get four million people all those things in one year? Ultimately, what happens is they extend it to the to about 1871, but still, it it kind of shows those kind of differing views on Reconstruction even uh, shortly after the Civil War is over. Yeah, and I want to, you know, by way of getting us, you know, to our conclusion tonight, to talk a little bit about this question. When we meet with other park rangers and we ask them if they'll do parked at home with us, we always have some bigger theme in mind. We have something that we think would be a good spark between the two parks. And in this case in particular, we thought about land as opportunity. And one of the reasons that that comes up for us a lot is there are specific things about the Blackstone River Valley. The way that a glacier moved thousands of years ago made the landscape a certain kind of way that made colonists and industors, investors in industry keen on building mills. Those are simple facts. And we have this quote we use a lot from a historian named Seth Rockman, where he talks about the fact that cotton didn't grow along the Blackstone. Not sort of a small fact, but it has a big consequence for how people are going to run mills in the Northeast and consequences for people in the South. I wanna just share a few photos briefly uh, by way of conclusion with us tonight. And I wanna take us away from Ashton just a moment, get us away from this mill. And I wanna talk very briefly about a photographer and some of the long-term consequences of the Civil War. Last week when we met with a ranger from Eisenhower, there was a big discussion about the fact that growing up and hearing stories and not being so distant from the Civil War would have a huge impact on Dwight Eisenhower and eventually his presidency and the way that he thought about war and why he chose to retire next to Gettysburg, why he made that decision. 
this war continues to have a very long shadow and a very long imprint. And there are pockets of Worcester where that shadow would have been especially well known. This photograph was taken by someone named William Bullard and he took a lot of pictures. He traveled throughout Worcester, but he had a few specific communities where he did extensive photography. And he did something that all historians wish people would do more and better. He labeled them. He told us who are actually in these photographs. And so he creates this amazing treasure trove that is not known about for a good period of time. And just a few years ago, the Worcester Art Museum put these photographs on display. And they were able to connect with a bunch of different descendants of the people in these photographs. And I'll explain to you what this has to do with the Civil War. One particular Massachusetts regiment that was in North Carolina during the war in a place called New Bern connected with a lot of self-liberated people, Black men and soldiers. And as part of that process, they got a lot of aid. They didn't know where they were. These were boys and men from Massachusetts, from Worcester, and they're in an unfamiliar place. And they make promises to people that they meet in the South. And those people, they check in on those promises a year later, and they actually move to Worcester and they create a community of free black people. And they are part of an absolutely enormous boom, a series of migrations that will happen when many of those promises of reconstruction fail because they will fail over and over. I wanted to share the photograph of this family and I'll also share another photograph of family in Worcester just over a hundred years ago because this is part of our industrial story as well. Our story from Providence to Worcester is not just about people who worked in mills. Sometimes it's about all of these tangential connections and the time that people spend away from industry. When men were forced to serve in the military or chose to become missionaries, to travel to the South, to be part of ending slavery, sometimes they met people and their worlds expanded in ways they could not have anticipated. We do Parked at Home because we love to learn about other park stories, but sometimes we can't always travel. We know that travel expands our minds, helps us to connect and think differently. And sometimes the way that we do that now is through a screen. Bullard did it with the power of a camera. He captured a community in real time. And it's a reminder that this large process called reconstruction involved real people. And when reconstruction failed real people, they took action. Sometimes that meant contacting a soldier they'd met in the early 1860s and asking if they could come to Worcester. I'll end tonight before we get into our informal program with this quote. Uh, this quote famously comes at the end of Eric Foner's history of reconstruction. And because we are a place that is very much defined by the flow of a river and the valley that it creates, I wanted to give you something that comes from a person who freed themselves and decided to come to Massachusetts and to live out that freedom there. He's talking about the river has its bend and the road must terminate. Reconstruction for many people is something that's over. It's in the past. But I think a lot of activists and others might encourage us to think of it as a process that got started but never really finished. So this is a person who came and saw Massachusetts and the valley and this area as a land of freedom. For many others, it has not been. Uh, but we really encourage you to stay, to chat with us if you wish, to learn a little bit more about reconstruction. I wanna make sure that we say thank you to Rich who had a very long day <laughs> uh, staffing his site. He works at a very busy park uh, where rangers do a lot of work spread out across different sites. And it really was our pleasure to connect with him tonight. Thank you all so much for having me. Thank you.